OK, so let's write out our general Fourier transform matrix. So F sub n, it's just some matrix 1 over square root n, ones across the first uh, row, 1 omega, omega squared, omega to the n minus 1, 1 omega to the n minus 1, omega to the n minus 1 squared. Okay, so it's some matrix like this. And then, of course, what you can do is, in general, you give it as input some n-dimensional vector, complex vector, alpha naught through alpha n minus 1. And you get as output a complex vector, beta naught through beta n minus 1. Okay, so... So the computing the Fourier transform is the the Fourier transform is a transformation which takes as input an n-dimensional vector alpha and outputs an n-dimensional vector beta. Now, how difficult is this task? Well, classically, the naive al algorithm takes order n squared steps. And the reason is because to, to compute some arbitrary entry beta sub j, what you'd have to do is take the jth column, sorry, the jth row of this matrix and take the inner product with, the, with this column vector. And that, of course, requires order n multiplications and additions. But now you have to repeat this for every entry, and so, so that takes n times order n steps, which is order n squared steps. Now there was a one of the one of the great breakthroughs in in the field of algorithms was this um, was was the was the fast Fourier transform. which was also called the FFT, which was formalized by Cooley and Tukey in the 60s. And uh, what this does is it gives, a, it gives an algorithm which runs in order n log n steps, so nearly linear time. This speed up of a quadratic factor was a very dramatic um, was a very important speed up, and this is responsible. You know, this is at the basis of uh, um, much of digital signal processing. So, you know, the 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 use of um, uh, digital technology in audio and video processing is basically made possible by this algorithm. Now, let's let's turn instead to the quantum case. So, in the quantum case, of course, this this input this this n-dimensional input vector. It's natural to interpret it as the state of a of a system of log n cap quantum bits. So, if we let little n equal to log of capital N, so think of capital N as a power of two then this is the state of little n qubits, which happen to be in the state sum over j of alpha j j. And what the quantum Fourier transform does is it transforms this state into the new state sum over k of beta k, k. And now the, the remarkable thing about this is that the circuit, the quantum circuit to carry this out, works in a number of steps that only scales polynomially in little n. So in the next video, we'll see that we can we can carry out this quantum Fourier transform in big O of little n squared 
steps, which is just big O log squared capital N steps. It turns out that if you work a little harder, you can get down to nearly linear in little n steps, which means nearly linear in log n steps. But but it doesn't matter. So the the main thing is you can go from going from here to here is an exponential improvement. Okay, and this is you know this is where the power of quantum mechanics comes in, the power of quantum com computation comes in. Except that there's a bit of a rub here. The rub is that well, the quantum Fourier transform does carry out this transformation from the alpha vector to the beta vector exponentially faster than the classical Fourier transform can, can carry out this transformation. The problem is that the quantum state, of course, you know, the, the, the amplitudes within the quantum state are inaccessible to us. And so all we can do is we can perform a measurement. And when we measure, we just see k with probability beta sub k magnitude squared. So we just see one of these indices k, right? With with some with probability beta sub k magnitude squared. So we don't get access to the beta sub, g, beta sub k's, but just to this much simpler probability distribution, to a sample from this distribution. So, you know, there was um, um, once um, the, the founder of Intel Corporation, uh, Gordon Moore, was giving a lecture where he was talking about Moore's law in this this uh, phenomenon that the um, you know that the number of transistors that you can pack onto a chip has been doubling roughly every 18 months going back several decades now you know so this exponential increase in the number of transistors in computing power you know decrease in size uh, decrease in cost so he was talking about how um, you know, if if this kind of uh, if the automobile industry had been on on the same trajectory, then you know already he was giving this this speech um, over a decade ago. He was he was saying, well then if if the automobile industry had, had been on that same same trajectory, then a Rolls Royce would give you uh, hundreds of thousands of miles to a gallon of of petrol, it would travel at a tenth of the speed of light, and it would cost, you know, less than a nickel. And then some wise guy in the audience piped up and said, and it would be smaller than a matchbox. Well, so that's sort of what we have here. We have in the quantum Fourier transform, we have something which is incredibly powerful. You know, it's uh, very fast, it's incredibly powerful, it's, you know, there's this ex exponential speed up. But then, on the other hand, by being so, so powerful, you know, there's this price to pay, which is, there's very little of it. So you get, you, you don't get the entire output, you just get to get a sample of the output. And so the whole trick to using the quantum Fourier transform is, you know, how do you use this effectively in an algorithm? And that's what we'll see in the in the next lecture.